Jordan with the Great Plains Institute, and I serve as a facilitator for the Midwestern Clean Fuels Policy Initiative. This is a, a, a broad-based stakeholder effort aimed at, at developing clean fuel policies that are tailored to the economic and technical and resource realities of the Midwest with the attention of uh, in enhancing uh, regional competitive competitiveness and production of clean fuels and uh, enhancing uh, regional economic development. This is the first webinar in a series that focuses on renewable diesel and in particular renewable diesel produced uh, from woody feedstocks. Uh, this does tie into a, a broader conversation within the forest products industry about balancing uh, economic development and environmental benefits. Uh, there has been a robust conversation taking place about the need for additional markets for wood, particularly uh, underutilized wood such as mill residuals, non-marketable wood, forest residuals, and uh, underutilized species, and, and the importance in particular of developing new markets for uh, insect and disease killed wood in order to, um, to enable management uh, to achieve other environmental objectives. Uh, clean fuel policies are driving project development in a variety of different areas, and that includes uh, renewable diesel from wood. Uh, so that's the area we're going to focus on today and, and really focus on this, striking this balance between uh, new markets, new investment, and uh, environmental sustainability. Sorry, I just had a little technical glitch there. Um, so we're gonna first, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, introduce everybody right away, but we have a very busy agenda. We're hearing from a lot of leading experts in the, in the field. Uh, we'll first get an overview from Eric Singsas uh, from the Natural Resources Re Research Institute on renewable diesel technology. Uh, here's some analysis from Jesse Wyatt with the Great Plains Institute about the expected impacts of a, a Midwestern clean fuel policy on renewable diesel projects. And then we'll hear from a number of leading experts uh, as part of a panel discussion. Uh, this uh, webinar is supported by uh, a, a number of uh, uh, organizations which are up on screen I won't list and uh, also want to, want to give a thanks to a couple of organizations that helped organize this event, uh, including the Natural Resources Research Institute and Waterford Oil. So with no further ado, uh, we're going to move right on to our first presenter. This is uh, just an overview on all the presenters you'll hear from, and I'll, I'll introduce them as they start. Uh, starting with Eric Singsas. Uh, is the Materials and Bioeconomy Research Group Leader at the University of Minnesota's Natural Resources Research Institute. Eric, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Go ahead. Great. Thank, thank you, Brennan and, and colleagues for the invitation. Uh, and I uh, presume that you will be uh, sharing sharing slides for me. That's correct. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as um, as Brendan mentioned, I'm I'm materials and bioeconomy group director. I've done uh, a considerable amount of work with uh, various kinds of uh, biomass processing, from wood products to uh, to paper products to biorefinery technology. Uh, and I I they asked me to kind of summarize the kind of give you the big picture umbrella overview of renewable diesel from uh, from wood. Uh, and so I, I, I've summarized a lot of a lot of data, mainly from uh, uh, scientific literature publications, uh, and I'm, I'm expecting um, I, I, I'm expecting that uh, there are you know there's a lot of technologies that have been developed that, that are proprietary, and um, I, I I'm not intending to uh, uh, talk about any one particular. Uh, technology so much as talk more about more broadly about the main pathways that are, exist out there in the literature that people are exploiting. Uh, 
uh, to uh, to produce renewable diesel. Uh, and uh, secondly, I'll I'll kind of talk a little bit about um, uh, the differences, or I'll start with the differences between renewable diesel and biodiesel, which most which I think is more familiar to most people. Is there a next slide? So uh, with that, this is a, this is meant to be really a technology overview. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so uh, here's the the overview for my talk of review, renewable versus biodiesel. Uh, a little bit of context, and then I'm going to focus really on three three pathways. Again, these are not the only pathways, and there are a lot of technologies that are rifts on these pathways. We'll hear about some of them later today. Uh, pyrolysis oils, gasification, and uh, what are called liquefied lignin distillates. Next. So uh, there's, there's three ways to look at the, the distinction between biodiesel, which exists on the market today, and, um, and renewable diesel. The first is the legal perspective. It's both codified in US law on the top and also in Minnesota state law. Both of these um, the language in both of these highlight two different things. One in the light blue color, the aqua color, is the type of molecule. Monica alkyl esters is just specifying what specific molecule it is. And then the in what's highlighted in green in both of them is the source. And the source of both of these by law for biodiesel has to be fatties or basically fats derived from either plants or animal matter. So go on to the next slide. Uh, another way to look at this is from the perspective of as an engineer. Engineers, uh, whether you're operating or developing engines, need a fuel specification. And this fuel specification for biodiesel falls under the ASTM D6751. Uh, and it has all of the in the uh, column under biodiesel, you can see the, the specs for that particular fuel. Uh, diesel fuel falls under ASTM D975, uh, and you can see the specifications on the right-hand side. And the specifications are different from those, and I've highlighted in yellow a few things that are key differences. Pay attention to the one highlighted that's oxygen. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Um, but also, you know, some of the issues people have, especially with cold weather performance of biodiesel, uh, you know, uh, biodiesel uh, uh, lacks some of the cold cold performance, and I've highlighted the, what are called the cloud point and, pull, and pour point. You can see the differences between the ASTM uh, biodiesel standard and the ASTM diesel standard. So both so biodiesel meets a very specific standard for a specific fuel, but that standard is different from diesel fuel. And I think if you click one more time. Um, the objective of renewable diesel is to make from a renewable resource like woody plants, uh, woody biomass, uh, is to make something that meets that ASTM D975 diesel standard. Click again, next slide. Another way to look at this is the way, the way I think is, uh, is as a chemist. Uh, and there's a lot going on here. I'll just kind of walk you quickly through there. Uh, on the left hand, on the y-axis, um, is the uh, it's basically the ratio of oxygen to carbon. Uh, more oxygen as you go up, less oxygen in a product as you go down. And then uh, on the bottom axis, on the x-axis, is the hydrogen to carbon ratio, where you have more hydrogen uh, as you go to the right, less hydrogen as you go to the left. Uh, now, if you click once, I'll highlight a couple of fuels. Um, you know, true diesel, gasoline, and kerosene, as I mentioned, have essentially no oxygen in them. Uh, so they're at the bottom, at the bottom part of that axis there. Uh, click again. Things that are classified as biodiesels, they're FA FAMES or FAES, uh, fatty acid methyl esters, for example. Um, those have uh, roughly the same hydrogen ratio, but roughly the uh, but uh, a, a bit more oxygen. And that's part of the reason for the difference between those. Click one more time. Uh, we'll mention a couple of other bio-based fuels. Of course, most people are familiar with ethanol. And I will mention dimethyl ether briefly uh, later on. So I just want to point out where they are on there. The next in green are the three um, 
there are three components of woody biomass. You can see that where they are chemically on that, on that uh, uh, field. And the processing technologies are to turn those, uh, those ratios uh, into the ratios that are similar to uh, or equivalent to diesel by both excluding oxygen as well in, as increasing hydrogen. Lastly, click one more time. I'm gonna mention two other things, pyrolysis oil and hydro, uh, hydrothermal liquefaction oil briefly. Uh, so you can just see where those are as, as, as key intermediates to making uh, a renewable diesel auto biomass. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are uh, several, there are three key pathways to turning bio, woody biomass into fuels, the physical, thermochemical, and biochemical. Most, I'm gonna focus only on the things that are in yellow here because these are the pathways that lead to, uh, as I said, an ASTM diesel fuel as other, well as other related products. So the gasification, the pyrolysis, and then briefly uh, as part of a co-product scenario with a biochemical process. Next, next slide, thank you. So the first is a pyrolysis oil. Typically uh, in a pyrolysis oil process, you're gonna um, heat up biomass in a low oxygen atmosphere, typically up to about 500 degrees Celsius. That uh, produces uh, gases, much like when you burn wood in a wood stove and the gases com are combusted. In a low oxygen atmosphere, the back gases do not combust. They can be condensed. Uh, and in, a, in a what's called a quencher, uh, you get a co-product of what's called a, a solid product. That's a biochar. Uh, and then you can condense those oil and you can, you can, that oil becomes something that looks like oil. And the picture on the right hand side, I've, I've, done, I've done these at the benchtop scale quite a bit. Uh, you have something that looks superficially like oil and uh, it can be processed into uh, fuels. However, if you go to the next slide, back to this world of specifications, it's important to know that that pyrolysis oil isn't the same thing as a fuel. Uh, in fact, it's not the same thing as crude oil. In fact, I, on the, in the middle, we have pyrolysis oil. On the right hand side is a standard is, you know, there's a lot of specs, but this is basically what uh, the difference between a, a crude oil looks like. Specifically, uh, pyrolysis oil has a lot of water content, typically has an acidic pH, uh, and uh, in particular has a high oxygen content compared with crude oil that is the main feedstock for making diesel fuel uh, that we're familiar with. Next slide. So in order to get a, an ASTM spec diesel, there have been a lot, a lot of different technologies for so-called upgrading of pyrolysis oil into diesel oil. This is an older slide, admittedly, and there's probably new technology that I'm not reflecting here. But uh, as of a few years ago, these were the technologies that people had been piloting. Uh, and you can see that what's the color or the shading in here is the basically the darker the, darker the shading, the more either expensive or difficult. Uh, this process is, uh, or basically the bigger hurdle to, de to commercializing these processes. So that's pathway number one, pyrolysis oil. If you go on the next one, the second is a process called gasification. Similar to py pyrolysis, you're heating up uh, biomass in a low oxygen atmosphere. Uh, you're typically between 600 and 1000 degrees Celsius, whereas you were below, you're up to 500. Uh, for pyrolysis. And that gasification uh, tears the, the molecules apart even more so. So instead of getting things that look somewhat like crude oil, you're primarily getting gases. And that gas is a, is called, is a mixture of carbon monoxide, hydrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide. And um, that's called a syngas. Uh, and then that syngas, you can use catalysts to take those small molecules and put them together. Uh, and that's called a Fischer-Tropsch process. And it does allow you to make an ASTM 975 fuel. Next slide, please. Uh, and I've just highlighted out here, Syngas is, is a pretty useful technology. Uh, and you can see that there is a number of different products you can make out of a Syngas. And I just highlighted in the, in the big purple arrows the way through Fischer-Tropsch fuels that you can make diesel or a kerosene, basically a jet fuel, uh, 
uh, and uh, gasoline, as well as different kinds of waxes. I, I only wanted to point out the other the other pathway that's been in uh, that's relevant to diesel is through methanol to something called DME dimethyl ether, which uh, a number of places, particularly Northern Europe, they've investigated, it, it, which can be uh, burned in a modified uh, diesel engine uh, as well. And then and so these are kind of two ways to run diesel engines off of a syngas base of base product. Next slide, please. Very briefly uh, at the end, um, the last way is, is through a biochemical model. Uh, and the biochemical model is, is, really, um, is really a parallel with what we're familiar with corn ethanol, where you have uh, glucans or sugars in corn. You also have glucans from cellulose in woody biomass. Um, and those can be separated from the other components. Uh, and those glucans can be converted to, um, by fermentation to corn ethanol. The byproduct with corn is animal feed. The byproduct with wood is something called lignin. And one of the things uh, that you can do with lignin, if you go on to the next page, uh, is uh, make a couple of different kinds of fuels. The simplest way is through a cracking process, what's called a, a cracking process, and you make a liquefied lignin fuel. It's a low grade fuel, but it is available for turbine engines like you and, uh, and large engines that will use uh, uh, heavy fuel oil, such as in shipping. But then if you further process it, there are some technologies to, um, that are proprietary to further process that to make a true ASTM D975 uh, uh, renewable diesel. It's that distillate fuel on the right-hand side. You can see that the diesel is much is clearer compared with the dark black liquefied lignin. So next slide, please. So. That's just a really high spot overview. I just wanted to kind of set the stage for our other, other uh, panel members here uh, the, to build off of as we go forward. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Eric, and a, a virtual round of applause for you. Um, it's been a great overview and, and, and a great start to this webinar. Uh, next, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Jesse Wyatt, uh, who's an analyst at the Great Plains Institute. This really transitions into, you know, this is the technology, renewable diesel from wood. And how does this relate to the conversation about a, a clean fuel policy? What kind of incentives might exist under a Midwestern clean fuel policy to support uh, investment in projects like this in our region? Uh, so Jesse, uh, you can take it away. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you, Eric, for that um, really helpful introduction. We can go to the next slide. And we can actually go to the, the even next slide. So what is the clean fuels policy? As Brendan noted, we're kind of shifting gears here. Um, for folks unfamiliar, it's a market-based policy that serves to provide valuation to any fuel with a greenhouse gas advantage. And how does it do that? Um, so it starts out by setting a standard, which aims to reduce the carbon intensity of all fuels over time. Um, and the primary motivators for pursuing or investigating a, a CFP is um, sort of twofold, the first being that it creates incentives for fuel producers to lower their carbon intensity. That can happen through a variety of means. Some examples include that production process efficiency improvements, um, like the chart that Eric showed, um, finding intervention points there to reduce emissions at any of those process um, efficiency points. The second being switching to lower carbon fuel or feedstocks, so the actual input um, and having some, some leeway there. And the third being to decarbonize the fuel and feedstock supply chains, which could extend to um, even transporting the fuels. The, the other um, primary motivation is the result of reduced use of higher carbon fuels and some support for commercial deployment. So we recognize and, and the policy recognizes that it's sometimes difficult to um, get over that initial technological and, and financial hurdle. And so this, this policy really helps to, to create pathways and opportunities for commercial um, uh, producers to do so. Next slide. So how does it work a little more um, graphically maybe for the visual learners like myself? So the graph at right is showing um, the basic mechanics of this policy. You see the carbon intensity, which is just how many emissions the specific fuel um, emits at left, and then it, it runs over the course of the policy time frame. So you see the, the creation of sort of two distinct zones. The one at top is in red and shows fuels falling above that carbon intensity standard line. Um, and those fuels are generating what's considered a deficit. So they're not in compliance with the standard. 
And then you have this um, much larger zone below the carbon intensity standard, fondly referred to as the opportunity zone, um, and under which fuels are generating credits. And it's important to note that the fuel producers that are meeting or exceeding, which means that they fall below the standard, um, they're generating credits proportional to the difference between their fuel carbon intensity and that standard line. So the further you can um, go down in this graphic, the greater your proportional credit generation and opportunity. So I said credits quite a bit. I didn't actually say what those are. Um, the unit is typically tons of carbon dioxide or CO2. And they're assigned like in, in um, most markets based on uh, supply and demand. So the volume of fuel and then the reduction from the CI baseline. We know that credit prices can fluctuate according to the market. So um, it's, it's often difficult to forecast what the dollar value assigned to a credit might look like. However, we do have two distinct historic examples from the state of California and the state of Oregon where they have adopted a clean fuels policy. We see in California that the price per ton um, of a, a credit uh, started around $15 back in 2011 uh, and skyrocketed up to $185 back in 2019. And we saw a similar upward trajectory for Oregon um, when they adopted their policy in 2016. Um, and then it you know, tripled by 2019, the credit price. So useful proxy, uh, it's not exact for what a Midwest would look like, but we can use it to understand what, um, you know, conservative and likely benchmarks would be for a credit price in our region. So how do those fuel CI calculations work? Um, to understand the emissions intensity of a specific fuel, we use something called the Greenhouse Gas Life Cycle Assessment, or GHG LCA. And that provides an estimation of the emissions associated with a, a given fuel from the initial feedstock production, which is the choice of what feedstock you're using to generate the fuel all the way to use through refining. Um, and that sort of uh, array of, of the fuel's life is called well to wheel. And you can see that shown in the diagram at the bottom um, where you know well to wheel spans from the, the um, feedstock all the way to use in the vehicle. And that's in contrast to well to pump, which would stop at the delivery of the fuel to a vehicle um, to note. And we, um, we note here that Argonne National Laboratory has already devised an extremely comprehensive model called GREET, which calculates those well to wheel carbon intensities of various fuel production pathways um, for alternative fuels. And that, will, that includes renewable diesel fuels. I did include a note on this slide that the vehicle use phase, which is that final um, use in the well to wheel, does account for drivetrain efficiencies. Next slide. So that was a whirlwind of, of analytics, um, but a key function of the analysis we've been trying to understand is translation of that analysis into policy. So I give this slide as both a primer and a caveat. Um, I'm going to go through a couple example carbon intensities of um, renewable diesel pathways. And I wanna note that these are in no way prescriptive of policy or legislation. So something really important to understand about a CFP is that it accepts producer specific carbon intensities and those are based on individual LCAs. So if I am a X producer, I would to participate in the market, submit my LCA, um, get it approved and they would assign and my score would be assigned from that calculation. I wouldn't be assigned um, the scores that you're about to see or a blanket score for a renewable diesel, for example. Uh, and I already sort of noted, but Argonne National Laboratory's GREET model is the primary tool for conducting those LCA assessments. Next slide. So uh, we learned a lot from Eric, but just as a, as a primer, we know that renewable diesel fuel pathways diverge into these two sort of camps. We have the biomass, biomass or wood-based renewable diesels. Um, and for today, we looked at two different um, example pathways. So we looked at wood, um, wood feedstock, which was 100% woody biomass feedstock using some of the great defaults reported in their 2020 model. And then we also looked at renewable diesel um, reported by industry experts, which was also 100% woody biomass feedstock, but they specified that it assumed that if, for those who remember the thermochemical processes, um, the pyrolysis production process. And then in contrast, and sort of to understand where wood falls on the spectrum, um, we also, you can look at oil or lipid-based renewable diesels, which can originate from 
sort of a slew of feedstocks, notably corn, soybean oil, as well as other crops and um, animal residues. So those are just for proxy um, for this. So next slide. This is what the example modeled carbon intensities of those fuel pathways look like. So you can see the top two bars are showing those wood-based renewable diesel pathways. So the green um, default is showing 26.3 grams per megajoule, which is, I think I failed to mention, the, the typical unit for carbon intensity. And then the, uh, the industry reported average for 100% uh, woody biomass based renewable diesel is 18 grams per megajoule. You can see that all of the oil and lipid based renewable diesel pathways fall below that um, and sort of span the gamut depending on the feedstock input. They're all also using GREAT. And then you can see how all of these renewable diesel pathways compare to the diesel baseline at right, um, which is that dotted black line. So that's what the fuel would be um, trying to fall below in that that graphic we showed of the two the opportunity zone, um, anything below that baseline is, is, is has the opportunity to generate credits. So helpful to understand um, just how competitive wood-based renewable diesel could be in a, a CFP market. Next slide. And this shows uh, those same two pathways, but now we've expanded the universe outside of renewable-based or uh, renewable diesel-based fuels into other alternative fuels that may opt to compete in uh, clean fuels policy. So you can see uh, wood to renewable diesel industry average and greet are still in the brown. And then we've added um, an electric vehicle charged on a regional average grid mix, which is um, slightly has a slightly higher carbon intensity score. We see some uh, compressed natural gas options below. So renewable CNG is compressed natural gas and conventional CNG. Um, and you can see how wood, re, wood based renewable diesel is still competitive there. And then we also have biodiesel for reference at the bottom with 36.7 grams per megajoule. And finally, we, um, as I alluded with that credit um, market slide, we tried to translate what a hypothetical value would look like to a producer if they were to um, submit one of these pathways into a CFP. So you see the uh, credit value over 10 years for uh, example, $100 per ton and $200 per ton credit price. So 100 being quite conservative, 200 being more in line with California credit prices. For a wood um, great default, you're looking at 60 cents to 76 cents per gallon of, of credit value. And then for that industry average, you're looking at 74 to 90 cents per gallon. Um, and for some additional context, um, we looked at conservative credit value estimates of $100 per ton and the existing 900 million gallon renewable diesel market across the country would be looking at a credit generation opportunity between 540 and 666 million uh, US dollars. So not an insignificant impact to the industry as a whole. Next slide. Um, so thank you for <laughs> attending that whirlwind CFP primer with me. We are in the process of um, submitting case studies to stakeholders for review. We would love to hear from you on um, a final draft of a renewable diesel case study. And I note here that it includes more than just those wood-based uh, fuel pathways. It includes all of the other oil and lipid-based pathways as well. And so we would love to hear if there are any questions that you have on that, any sections that need clarity. Um, I believe you'll receive the draft by email after this webinar. Uh, and then if you have any questions that remain after you've read it. So we'd love to get that feedback by Thursday, May 13th. Um, my colleague, Caitlin Bachland, her email is here. Or if you received an email from Hannah, you can submit to the email that you have. Um, would, would love to hear from you. So thank you all. Uh, and I believe we have some time for questions. So I think probably in the, in the interest of time, I'm gonna suggest we hold questions for the end. Um, I also note, I am seeing some questions coming in via the Q and A function. And so uh, that's a great way to go. Uh, we will uh, try to hold on to those questions if there's, uh, with, with whatever time's available at the end, but we can also as staff try to, to answer some of these if we're able to, if it's a simpler one that can be answered live. But yeah, that's gonna be a great way to get questions in the queue and you can just 
put them in there whenever they come to you and then that we'll have a record of them when we come to the uh, discussion section at the end. Uh, so thank you very much, Jesse, uh, for, for a great and indeed whirlwind overview. And, uh, you know, so that I think establishes the connection here between uh, renewable diesel projects from wood and uh, a clean fuel policy, which is really driving a lot of investment nationally and uh, potentially presents an opportunity for the Midwestern region to see more investment in projects. At this point, uh, we're gonna move into our panel discussion. So our first panelist is Dr. Jim Boyer. Uh, Dr. Boyer is a, a professor emeritus uh, with the University of Minnesota Department of Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering. And he's also a senior contributor to Dovetail Partners. Jim, uh, thanks uh, for joining us and, and the, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I'd like to just follow up um, with what Jesse said. And so if I could have the first slide, please. <clears throat> um, she talked about life cycle assessment of fuels. And so this is just a kind of a, a general outlook of what an LCA looks like. Um, but a life cycle assessment looks at pretty much everything. Uh, from beginning to end uh, throughout the life of a, of a given good. So here on the right, you can see the pathway uh, through which uh, a fossil resource would be processed into diesel, as opposed to on the left side, if we were looking at a bioenergy system uh, going from a land-based uh, material such as wood um, and through all the steps that might occur. Next slide, please. So in, in graphic form, it kind of looks like this, starting with the forest on the left, uh, tracking all inputs and outputs uh, through extraction um, of, of, uh, of um, fossil fuels that might be used to uh, drive harvesting operations and processing operations and so on, uh, go through processing of fuels, uh, production of co-products, and appropriate allocation of, of part of the, uh, the inputs to, to co-products, uh, disposal of, uh, of waste, and then through use, and then looking at what happens to the atmosphere. Now, in all of this process, what's assumed, um, the, the numbers that Jesse showed you, basically a life cycle assessment shows about a 65 to 70 percent uh, energy advantage uh, compared to the, uh, the pathway coming from fossil fuels um, by going through renewable diesel. But an underlying assumption is that when you remove uh, wood or biomass from the forest, uh, that's carbon neutral. Now, there's no question that if woody biomass comes from, say, mill waste, and there is not very much in the way of mill waste anywhere in the United States today, but if it were to come from mill waste, then there's no question uh, that what the fuel is, is carbon neutral. But there have been questions raised about the carbon neutrality of harvesting woody biomass and then using it for anything, including uh, something like biodiesel. So what I'm gonna do in the next few slides is just talk generally about the carbon situation in US forests, and then I'll go to a specific example of harvesting for biomass, uh, for, for uh, biomass to fuel operation. Uh, many LCAs have showed a, a reduction on the order of 52 to 54%, and that's really a, a typical uh, biodiesel. If you go to renewable uh, diesel, then the reduction, as I indicated, is more like 65 to 70, depending upon what uh, the technology is. So we're, at, we're looking at the question here about carbon dynamics. Next slide, please. All right, so if we look overall at the United States and just look at the forest situation, um, we've had a stable forest area in the United States for uh, at least last 110 years, something like that. Um, and we, if you look at recent years, the last couple of decades, we've actually had an increase in forest area uh, over the last 20 years or so. And that is a continued uh, transition from farmland to, to uh, coming back, in, abandoned farmland coming back in the forest. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Furthermore, if we look at uh, total removals in US forests, and then we look at total growth, 
uh, growth is far in excess of removals in the United States. Overall, it's a, almost a two to one ratio of growth to removals. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and, and by the way, that harvest, about 90% of harvest from forest is from, from private forest lands. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So as a result of, of growth being much greater than harvest, what we're seeing is that the standing timber inventory in the United States is, is increasing steadily. Uh, you can see a little bit of, of if you look at 2007, 2012, 2007, the rate of increase in that standing inventory is beginning to slow. Uh, and you'll see that in the next slide, please. <clears throat> as um, growth exceeds harvest over long periods of time. What we're seeing is that natural mortality in U.S. forests is trending upward and it's trending upward quite sharply. Uh, the average age of trees in U.S. forests is becoming older. Um, the average diameter is becoming bigger and trees like all living things have a lifespan and, <clears throat> and as that's taking place we're seeing more and more natural mortality. Um, some of this is aided by <clears throat> um, climate change. Next slide, please. So if you track carbon <clears throat> in the above ground portion of standing trees, you see a pattern that looks like this. We're steadily increasing the carbon uh, within our forest across the United States. Um, and again, that rate of increase is slowing for the same reasons that we just talked about in previous slides. The next slide, please. If we look at total carbon inventory overall, which includes both above ground carbon and that which is below ground in several different forms, we can see a pretty steady uh, carbon inventory within the nation's forests. Next slide, please. So now we come to the question of, all right, well, what about the carbon dynamics of a forest? And what about you know, carbon, uh, the question of carbon neutrality? Here's a forest stand. So this is a small stand of trees. And let's say that that stand is periodically harvested. You take many or, or all of the volume of that stand. Uh, what, what does the carbon balance look like? Well, you'd have a periodic uh, situation in which you'd have quite a bit of carbon and then you'd take most of it away and then you'd regrow those trees and so on and so on as shown here. Next slide, please. But what if that stand is, is part of a forest parcel and now that forest parcel we would only harvest a portion of that uh, of the parcel each year. Uh, and when we do that we get a carbon a situation looks like on the left. Uh, now we have a, uh, a cyclical uh, look at our carbon within the stand but it's not as dramatic as what you saw previously. Next slide please. <clears throat> and then if that parcel is part of a, a bigger forest, an entire forest or a large forest block, uh, then the carbon situation looks more like this, uh, in which we essentially have stable carbon. <clears throat> so uh, from my point of view and from the point of view of many, many of my colleagues, uh, this is the situation that we look at to say that yes, indeed, uh, har periodic harvest is carbon neutral. Within the United States, remember, we're, we're actually in a situation where the carbon in forests is increasing over time, so we're even better than this. Those that challenge the whole business of carbon mortality will look at an individual stand and, and want to say that, well, when you remove trees from that individual stand, you're clearly affecting a carbon balance and you're creating a carbon debt. Um, um, and, and many of those studies, most of them, I've, almost all of them I've looked at, what they're ignoring is the bigger picture. The, the final statement I'll make here is uh, that there are some cases being made that there are forest areas in the United States that have potential, that they have a very intermittent fire history, long fire history, that have the capacity to store more trees on a given site. Uh, those have some validity uh, to them, and it's quite possible we could increase carbon on a given site with a different land uh, management regime. Uh, but on the whole, uh, for the reasons I've just stated, uh, I would argue uh, that the carbon mortality argument makes a lot of sense. So I'll stop there and hope we have some questions when we get to those. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Boyer. And our next speaker is Rick Horton, who's the Director of Forest Policy with Minnesota Forest Industries. Uh, Rick, take it away. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Minnesota Forest Industries is a trade organization representing the large primary consuming mills in the state of Minnesota. Next slide. Each year in Minnesota, uh, we harvest about 2.84 million cords of fiber. And you can see by this graphic, the utilization of that, but we're gonna be focusing mostly on the uh, lower unit, the wood energy unit, which is about 5% of the wood use. Next slide. So what are some of the uses of woody biomass? It can be used to generate steam heat, uh, to generate electricity, to produce liquid fuels, and also increasingly uh, it's being used to extract biochemicals. Next slide, please. So what are some of the benefits of, of using wood uh, for other things like this? Uh, one is that it would create new markets for woody material, which would help our industries um, with their competitiveness in the global economy. It also creates jobs in rural Minnesota's impoverished counties. Surprisingly, some of our northern counties are the most impoverished. Uh, it helps keep materials out of landfills. I'm speaking of materials that are byproducts from the mills. <clears throat> it uh, helps us address unhealthy forest conditions and it allows forest managers to help meet conservation goals. Next slide, please. So some of the sources, one is uh, mill residues. So talking about uh, sawdust, shavings, um, cull material, you know, logs that are not suitable for going through a milling process and bark. Uh, interestingly, only 50% of a log becomes lumber in a sawmill. When you take that log in and cut it up into uh, two by fours, over half of it is left over afterwards and you have to do something else with that. And what you do with that tends to be the profit margin often of a sawmill. Uh, if you can sell that product, then you're gonna do well. Uh, paper and OSB mills must debark the logs before they are put through the mill. And so it results in a lot of bark material. And again, marketing this can mean the profit or loss for the business. Next slide, please. Another source of uh, feedstocks is logging slash. After a logging operation, there are a lot of other materials, tops, limbs, and cull logs left on the site. And uh, some of it must be left for soil health and erosion control, but often it must be removed or piled and burned to facilitate reforestation. Uh, estimates are that there is 10 to 15 green tons per acre uh, left over after a logging operation, which would amount to about 1.8 million green tons per year of logging slash. Next slide, please. Another source is uh, timber damaged by wind, insects, fire, and disease that has to be salvaged. And uh, we've seen a lot of big blowdown events here in Minnesota, the occasional big fire. Um, that material is often unsuitable for processing. It's cracked, broken, sprung, uh, started to uh, degrade. So it often must be removed to facilitate reforestation and to prevent the spread of other diseases or the increased fire risk on that site. And keep in mind that uh, as part of the carbon cycle, carbon is released uh, from decaying. So if this stuff is left, it actually becomes a net emitter of carbon. Next slide, please. And another one is species without markets. Um, the way our logging system works when, when a timber sale is sold, the loggers must take all the timber that's specified in in the uh, sale contract, not just the pers preferred species. And it can be difficult because if there's no markets for some of those species, uh, you're basically losing money to take them down and you don't know what to do with them. Um, and often the foresters are specifying removal of that for future forest development. So those things could be used as biomass uh, in Minnesota. Right now, we've uh, got poor markets for things like birch pulp, uh, balsam fir pulp and tamarack. And removing them is often important to forest health. And, and uh, okay, next slide, please. So just about how much would we have? Uh, there's one study that suggested there's 402,750 green tons available annually within 75 miles of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, and an older study from the Department of Natural Resources suggested there was 2.25 million green tons a year from all sources. 
I should point out that we have the trucks and grinders and systems and infrastructure in place uh, to safely harvest that. And we do have a highly trained logging workforce that has experience harvesting biomass and hauling it. Next slide, please. Often you'll hear folks talk about the sustainability of, of using biomass for these other things. And um, some of the arguments, some of the roadblocks that are in the renewable fuel standard have to do with that concern over sustainability. There are several me uh, mechanisms in place in Minnesota to ensure that these materials um, are harvested sustainably and won't harm the forest environment, including the uh, Minnesota voluntary site level guidelines, which um, are the best management practices for timber harvesting. And uh, we've, we've built in biomass guidelines. Several years ago, we were using a lot of biomass for electricity generation. Uh, those, those facilities have since shut down, but at the time we developed biomass harvesting guidelines. Uh, a lot of our mills and our landowners are certified to the SFI or FSC standards. And the uh, Forest Service has federal policies in place to protect national forest lands. And again, I mentioned the Loggers are highly educated on how to implement these BMPs. Next slide, please. Forest products industry creates uh, 68,000 good paying jobs, um, primarily in Northern Minnesota, but you'd be surprised how many of those are actually down in the Metro area in manufacturing facilities. Next slide, please. And we do have uh, gross sales of $16.7 billion. Uh, and a contribution of about $7.3 billion to Minnesota's economy. Um, next slide, please. So major point is logging is a tool to manage forests. So this isn't all about material extraction. There's often things that wildlife managers and forest managers want to get out of the forest and, and logging is the tool that does that, helps address wildfire, windstorm, insect and disease issues from provides renewable products for human needs, absorbs carbon emissions to slow climate change and provides good jobs in rural communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. And our next speaker is Nels Paulson. Nels is the Policy Director for Conservation Minnesota. Nels, take it away. Thanks, Brendan. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Perfect. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nels Paulson, and I am the policy director at Conservation Minnesota. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit with an office in downtown Minneapolis and members in all of Minnesota's 87 counties. And we advocate for policies mostly at the Minnesota state legislature and a little bit at the federal level. And we work to improve the quality of the air we breathe and the water we drink. And we make sure that all Minnesotans have safe and equal access to open spaces and the, the great outdoors. And that's something we've, uh, we've truly come to appreciate uh, during the pandemic. When it comes to innovation in the transportation sector, Conservation Minnesota has been a member of the Midwest Clean Fuels Coalition. And we are thankful for the work Brendan, Caitlin, Hannah, and the staff at GPI uh, for their skills and their abilities, bringing so many stakeholders to the table to, uh, to solve some of our most pressing challenges. And uh, one of those challenges is, uh, has to do with transportation emissions. We are all well aware of the growing urgency to reduce carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions to improve air quality in our local communities and to prevent the worst effects of global climate change from taking hold. In Minnesota, we have resources that make us well positioned, not only to lower the carbon intensity of the transportation sector, but to create significant economic opportunities for our agricultural and forestry sectors. To guide us, there's already goals on the books in Minnesota to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors, as outlined by the 2007 Bipartisan Next Generation Energy Act. We've seen emissions from the electric utilities dropping as the grid becomes cleaner with more wind and solar supplying electricity. But the transportation sector has actually recently increased emissions, and this is why we're here today. In 2019, the Minnesota Department of Transportation released their Pathways to Decarbonizing Transportation Report, 
And one of the recommendations in the report is to strengthen Minnesota's petroleum replacement goals found at Minnesota Statute 239.7911. Strengthening the petroleum replacement goals also became one of the directives of Governor Walz's Council on Biofuels. And that council acknowledged that wood-based feedstocks can help improve forest health and other aspects of the natural environment while bolstering local economies. And next slide, please. The Governor's Council on Biofuels met virtually throughout 2020 to debate and develop recommendations on a number of biofuels related policies. And on the right, you can see some of these, including a low carbon fuel standard, E15 and biodiesel and advanced biofuels. And they also wanted to highlight that Minnesota is currently not on track with the state's petroleum replacement goals that you can see on the left. Conservation Minnesota was not a participant in the Council on Biofuels, but we observed most of the meetings and we were particularly encouraged by the innovative opportunities the council discussed when using feedstock from agriculture, forestry, and solid waste sectors. And I know we're focused on wood-based renewable diesel, so let's talk about that. We can go to the next uh, slide. As you can probably tell by now, I'm not employed by Conservation Minnesota for my advanced knowledge of biofuels chemistry or my ability to analyze the complex transportation fuels markets. But members of Conservation Minnesota expect our organization to advocate for innovation and policies that help create a healthy and thriving Minnesota. And wood-based renewable diesel could be developed into hitting this sweet spot. As, uh, as Rick mentioned, uh, logging and the forest products industry has existed in Minnesota for generations. However, many of those historically large users in the timber products industry have been in decline as plants and mills have closed. I'm told by the Minnesota DNR that recent forest inventory analysis by the US Forest Service shows that Minnesota is growing twice as much wood as we harvest per year. <clears throat> also, Conservation Minnesota has been a strong supporter of the Minnesota Forest Resources Council. I think I saw Mr. Abby's name on the attendees list. Uh, this council advises the governor and federal, state, and local governments on sustainable forest resources, uh, resource policies and practices. The Forest Resource Council has published the biomass harvesting guidelines for forest lands, brushlands, and open lands that Rick mentioned earlier. And I think the recommendations con contained within those guidelines show there's an opportunity to protect forested ecosystems and wildlife while also utilizing underused forest products like slash or diseased trees to support the feedstock needs of wood-based renewable diesel. Next slide, please. At Conservation Minnesota, we recognize that wood-based renewable diesel is still a relatively new idea in the forest products industry, but we're excited about supporting new innovation because we know many of the agencies and local governments that oversee most logging operations also encourage participation in third-party forest certification programs. Certification programs like the Forest Stewardship Council or the Sustainable Forestry Initiative helps ensure consumers of that forest products that the consumers of forest products that the forest land where those products came from was sustainably managed. Wouldn't it be kind of neat to uh, see an FSC or SFI certification logo on the diesel pump at the corner gas station, indicating that the wood-based renewable diesel came from a sustainably managed forest? There are also a number of benefits to wildlife from sustainably managed forests. For example, I know the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association has used sustainable harvesting to improve moose habitat in Northeast Minnesota. And maybe as you can tell by this photo, when I've been rough grouse hunting with my nephews, we appreciate the diversification of forest habitats that sustainable harvesting can bring. At Conservation Minnesota, we want every community to be healthy and thrive. And like Rick mentioned, <clears throat> um, Many communities that depend on the economic benefits of local mills are now looking for new ways to lift up their local economies and wood-based renewable diesel could help. I would also like to mention that some of the worst air quality in Minnesota is found along major highways like the I-94 corridor. And often communities around these major transportation corridors bear an unfair pollution burden from transportation emissions and cleaner transportation fuels could improve air quality in communities facing environmental justice concerns. Next slide, please. I can, uh, I can start to wrap up, but I, uh, first I wanted to leave this group with a couple ideas on how to improve the sustainability of wood-based renewable diesel. 
Sustainable working forests can help large forest tracts from becoming fragmented and preventing frag fragmentation can help both forest products companies and local wildlife populations. And two specific suggestions for the developers of wood-based renewable diesel might be to implement a transparent wood source hierarchy to make sure that fuel production remains sustainable for the long term. And another suggestion, uh, it seems like the Minnesota Forest Resources Council could maybe update their biomass harvesting guidelines because it's been, uh, I think about 14 years since those were last published. <clears throat> Next slide. And that is all I have. So thanks for, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Thanks a lot, Nels. So our, our next uh, final, final entry into the panel discussion is actually a joint uh, presentation. And I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Terry Kulesa with, uh, who's the CEO and co-founder of Red Rock Biofuels and Tad Mason, who's the CEO of TSS Consultants and are involved in a, a project, I think for, for those tracking this are, are well aware of the Red Rock uh, Biofuels Facility, which is a, a you know, commercial scale uh, deployment of renewable diesel technology. And so uh, I'm not sure who's gonna go first, but uh, I'll turn things over now to Terry and Tad. Uh, thanks, Brendan. This is Terry Kalesa, CEO of Red Rock Biofuels. I'll lead us off here. I'll do the first part of the presentation. Tad will do the forestry part because and I am no expert in forestry and Tad is. And so uh, I'll kind of give you a little background, the project introduction. Our project basically started about uh, eight years ago. Um, and it was, you know, it's like most ideas on the like back of a cocktail napkin and uh, kind of progressed into a project in uh, Oregon. Uh, the reason we chose Oregon uh, out west here, um, wildfires are a big, huge uh, issue for us uh, out here in the west. And uh, so it's to, to reduce wildfires, uh, we kind of came up with, a, with an idea of, you know, let's use that wood until of watching it get burned up. And so basically what we did is we put a, a project together that uh, takes advantage of existing technologies. And we, uh, we don't basically uh, develop technologies. We integrate technologies that we run across and, uh, what, and what find out in the marketplace. So we have a, a, a facility that's going to use about 166,000 a bone dry tons uh, per year of uh, woody biomass. Uh, we convert that into about 15 million gallons a year of renewable fuels and also into uh, some biochar, which goes into cement production as well. So, and, we, and, and then we also produce uh, CO2 off that wood. Uh, we release it from the wood and we'll capture that and we will uh, basically sequester that. And so we try to essentially take every, every bit of that uh, wood product that we can and use that uh, to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. So uh, with the feedstock we use, we uh, uh, Tad will talk about this more, but Green Diamond's probably one of our biggest suppliers out there. These are big landowners out west and uh, they're one of our, our major ones. Offtake, the jet fuel is gonna be sold to uh, FedEx and Southwest. Uh, we have eight year offtakes with that and then Shell will distribute the, uh, uh, the product to the airlines and also will distribute the diesel uh, and it'll probably be in California and Oregon. Uh, and the reason it is because uh, that area is where we're at, but also California, Oregon, and now Washington State have a low carbon fuel standard, and that's where the fuel is going to go. Uh, even if you make it Minnesota or whatever, right now, today, that fuel would end up in uh, California because of the uh, LCFS. Um, the EPC contractor is our group that we've uh, been doing this for a while. Technology is gasification, uh, basically in syngas cleanup. Uh, going to a fisher trope unit and then upgrading of the fisher trope products into jet fuel and diesel fuel at a 50 percent rate for each of them next slide please this is the view of our uh, site from april 5th uh, 2021 uh, we're hoping to get this project done uh, in one year from now probably about you know, june july of next year is kind of our goal uh, and it's about 60 percent complete at this point um, it's a big facility. Um, it's going to run close to about $400 million of construction at the end by the time it's all said and done. So it's a substantial investment and uh, these are just big facilities that just take a while to develop. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is our process. Uh, we basically take waste woody biomass. Uh, we take it the size of which comes into us about the size of a, uh, about a, a three and three and a half inch uh, wood chip. We grind it down to about the, uh, about the size of a toothpick, half the size of a toothpick. Uh, 
We go through a gasification process, which takes the temperature up to about, uh, the gasification part goes uh, typically up to about uh, 2200 degrees. Um, we convert that to a syngas. We clean that syngas up uh, before we go into a fissure trope. And that fissure trope just basically breaks that uh, uh, or puts that all back into together for us. And then we break it apart uh, in the upgrading uh, uh, process. On our whole process, it's interesting to uh, look at the only thing that's, that's not commercially uh, proven today is our gasifier. And that's been run at a demo stage, but not at a full commercial stage. And most of these gasifiers out there have only been run at demo stages on wood, uh, woody biomass. And the wood, uh, the, the big tough issue with these gasifiers and wood is the tars inside the wood that really get sticky and cause some issues. So the tar in the wood is the, is the real hurdle for these gasifiers on these projects. Next slide, please. Um, our RV will be a renewable zero carbon fuel by the time we get everything put in. Uh, we use solar and we also use uh, capture CO2 and we also uh, basically use slash piles. And so when we go to uh, the California Air Resources Board to get a, our carbon score, all those things are going to play and basically it is, you know, plus or minus five points uh, right around zero. Um, and so uh, we can drop right into liquid fuels, so there's no, we can blend right in, uh, just like ethanol does today. Uh, our the diesel will meet the ASTM spec, so there's already a spec in place for that. Um, and basically, the jet fuel already meets the specs, so there's a spec for that, so we don't have, have to jump through those hurdles. We're basically near zero sulfur aromatics, you're talking about air pollution, the last speaker was, and that's a big deal uh, right there. Clean burning, low tailpipe emissions, uh, low uh, air pollute air quality, you know, reduction in SOX and NOx and PMs. And basically, it, it really uh, helps uh, the engines as well. What they're finding is these air, airline, airplane engines can last twice as long because the fuel is very clean. Uh, they're still working on that, proving that out. There's a bunch of OEMs working on that uh, right now. So, uh, next slide, please. And uh, Tad, I am going to turn this over to you um, uh, for this to start your. Great. Thank you, Terry. Um, good afternoon. And um, I'm pleased to be part of this presentation. I've got a slide, I've got a short uh, side deck, slide deck to work from. Um, first off, the feedstocks utilized at Lakeview must be consistent with the 2007 update of the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard. I wanna be clear that uh, in order to secure RIMS credits, we need to make sure that these feedstocks are consistent with that standard. And in, in, in that uh, vein, the sustainability overview provides a a quick overview of what we're looking at as far as forest residue, no purpose grown crops. Um, we're, we're basically taking wood waste out of the forest in the form of slash and pre-commercial thinning and uh, converting that to transportation fuels. Next slide. As Terry noted, the facility will utilize 166,000 bone dry tons, tons a year. Uh, this is the equivalent of about 40 truckloads per day of, of forest material. Typically we're looking at three inch minus chip material coming in. So all of the processing is conducted in the woods. Um, because of that 2007 update to the renewable fuel standard from the um, Energy Independence and Security Act, um, only material from private or state lands can be utilized. No federal lands, uh, forest biomass uh, can be utilized because it's not considered renewable. And that's a whole nother debate, but uh, we, we do take issue with that. However, with the 2007 standard set, we must adhere to it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, slash is, is one of the components of the feedstocks this facility will be using along with pre-commercial thinning, but we'll have more on that in a second. Um, harvest activities, of course, are focused in Oregon and in California. 
if you remember the map of Lakeview, Oregon, it's almost on the border of uh, California, between California and Oregon. And so we'll be sourcing feedstock from, from both states. Uh, each state has their own forest practice rules. And of course, any harvest operations will be compliant with that. Uh, the facility will be set up to take in feedstock deliveries year round. Next slide. Okay, uh, there we go. All right, um, so we mentioned timber harvest residuals, also known as slash. Basically, uh, most of the timber harvesting in Oregon and California is a uh, whole tree harvest. So the entire tree is harvested and then skid to a landing where it is delimbed and topped. And the result is piles like this, timber harvest residuals. The current technique for disposal is, is, is burning, pile burning, which results in significant emissions, of course. Uh, our model here is to take this material, grind it up to three inch minus, and deliver it into Lakeview. Next slide. In addition, of, as mentioned earlier, pre-commercial thinning, this is basically um, typically a plantation thin, if you will, of smaller stems that are not considered commercial, i.e. the name or the title, pre-commercial thinnings. And this material is uh, harvested, chipped, and then delivered three inch minus. This is a picture of uh, Green Diamond Lines uh, manager standing in front of a, a, a bundle of material that's about, that will be yarded eventually and then chipped. Next slide. An example of some of the, the stocking control and wildfire mitigation uh, advantages of these techniques is our work in Northern Arizona. This is an example of a, a stand that has not been thinned. Uh, next slide. And then afterwards, um, of course, Northern Arizona is not Lakeview, Oregon. I, I just showed this as, as examples. Uh, we have yet to uh, actively commenced harvest for the Lakeview project. So just using this as an example. Next slide. And I think we're on to questions. All right, terrific. Well, uh, we're ahead of time. Appreciate everybody uh, staying on time. Uh, great uh, panel discussion. And so there are, feel free to, again, enter your questions into the Q&A. And uh, we have been trying to answer some of them as they come up. But you know, maybe what I'll start with is kind of taking things in order. There were a number of LCA related questions that got discussed. Um, there was a question about, uh, actually a couple questions about why the CI for corn oil is so low. Um, there were some questions about uh, tallow and used cooking oil. Um, Jesse, do you want to, uh, and you've answered some of these live in the chat, but maybe you want to take a crack at a few of those LCA questions? Sure. Um, so I think there are two questions that came up. The first was um, consideration for why corn oil's um, score was 11 grams per megajoule. And again, caveat, you know, these are just exploratory hypothetical scores. We use GREET. I think and I will have to go back and refer because unfortunately my brain doesn't keep all of this in there, um, but that it's it's attributing the corn oil feedstock as a byproduct of another primary process. So the emissions associated with the primary process are not attributed to the fuel production. I'll have to double check though. And then I think the other question was around supply of tallow and UCO or used cooking oil. And we actually haven't um, yet run any kind of in-depth analysis around specifically tallow or UCO supply as it would be available to meet new CFP demand. But I think that that's a really interesting question and something I'd love to dig into further. All right, thanks a lot. Um, you know, it, uh, it is also, this is also life cycle assessment related and, and this is a question directed at Tad, could be Tad or Terry. Uh, Jesse, you may be able to shed some light on this as well. It was really looking at the truck traffic, um, both uh, you know driving trucks to supply the facility and, and potentially other truck traffic uh, 
and obviously that has emissions. How much does that contribute to overall life cycle emissions? And, and is that incorporated? Uh, yeah, this is this is Terry. That is incorporated, and it, I, I don't want to say it's I want to say it's like ten points. I think somewhere in that area, and all it, it depends. Also, we we draw from about 125 mile radius, and so you have to calculate all that in, and also the what they do in the uh, woods as well. So you calculate that in, and also then we we rail it and and could truck it, but we rail it down to our supplier or uh, California. So we have to factor that in as well. So that does go have to go in your calculation. All these calculations have to be run through uh, California Air Resources Board have to be approved uh, before you can sell fuel or get the, get the credits in California, I should say. All right, terrific. Those are a couple good uh, life cycle assessment questions. Let, let's get into to renewable fuel standard. There were a number of questions offered up about the renewable fuel standard. You know, the, at the top of the pile was just, can you do both? <laughs> so I think it's it's important to probably clarify that there's separate policies. There's uh, clean fuel standards like the, the California and Oregon uh, programs. And then there's the federal renewable fuel standard. And both programs allow you to generate credits. It sounds like with the Red Rock project, you're doing you're doing both. But um, yeah, I could I could jump in here if you want. We yeah, do, we also do both. Yes. Uh, what we do is basically there one's the federal uh, program, one's a state program, and they both uh, apply. And there's and there's standards for both. And so, for example, you have to have a pathway that meets the RFS standard. Um, one of the biggest issues we run across is you know there's no RINs on federal land, so it must come off private land. Um, and out west, that's a big issue because a lot of the lands are uh, you know federally owned, and a lot of these states are. They, they, we get calls from government offices all the time. It's, Can you build a facility in our state because we have all this wood that's burning up? Uh, no, we can't basically take it off of uh, federal land right now. And so um, that's one of the RFS stipulations. And on the LCFS side, you got to make sure you meet all the, uh, uh, the, the uh, green models and all you have to basically get down to your LCI and has to be approved by CAR. So it's two different programs, but they both contribute substantially to your net revenues. And so that's why, you know, all these states ask me, what can we do to bring you to our state? You need an LCFS. Uh, right now, the most lucrative renewable fuel market in the world is California. And the Oregon's right behind that. So that's where all the fuels are going to go. Because of those two programs, when you stack them up, that's your revenue. Lots of revenue. All right. Um, that. That's great, thank you. Um, you know, I thought it would be worth. I don't want to spend too much time on RFS because there's a lot there, but you know, it might be informative, uh, and, and this might be a good one for Rick. You know, looking at the restrictions on the use of feedstock in the renewable fuel standard. You, you know, what are the restrictions for Minnesota specifically, or other Midwestern states? Well, as part of the renewable fuel standard, so the restrictions are pretty much universal across the US, but you know, some of the most problematic ones <clears throat> are the wood cannot come off of federal land, as was mentioned. You know, we have two national forests here with an, a lot of aging trees. So a harvest on those uh, federal sites tends to result in a lot more slash. Um, and then the other one being that it's not supposed to come from natural forests, supposed to come from plantation sources. Uh, we don't use plantations much, usually only in uh, spruce and pine systems are we using plantations. Otherwise, most of our forests are either naturally regenerated or regenerated from seed. And also the RFS says you can't mix those products at all. You know, in an ideal world, you could, as a producer say, well, we got a hundred tons in and 40 tons was from federal sources. So we're only going to use 60% of the product. Um, you can't, you have to keep that stuff entirely separate. So that's another big concern. So maybe a, maybe a question back to, uh, to Terry or Tad. So, you know, ideally you'd be able to claim RFS and clean fuel policy credits. Um, there, there's certainly some effort to, to make adjustments for RFS to try to you know, adjust some of those things to make that a little more workable in, in places like the upper Midwest. You know, could a project work with only clean fuel policy credits? 
Yeah, basically it can um, work with just clean fuel policy credits as well. Um, and I know uh, Clochar and uh, uh, Grassley and are working hard on getting that, uh, the RFS kind of expanded into some of those things for Minnesota and Michigan, Wisconsin, the, the, some of those areas as well. So, but you can make it on just the LCFS today. Now you remember is carbon trades about $20 a ton globally in California, it trades at two hundred dollars a ton. So there's a big gap there in the, the U.S. market, or I'd say the North American markets. Canada's included as well. Uh, with the LCFS and the RINs, it makes these projects a lucrative. The problem with these products are they're very expensive. And so uh, get, there's a question somebody asked about, you know, what, are we competitive, you know, with fuel? Yes, we are. We're competitive with the fuel. Where I'm not competitive is uh, the debt. So. Basically, if my cost of production is $1.50 a gallon, and essentially my debt could be $2 a gallon, right? And so that's the issue to build these facilities is that you have to have a high enough return to get investors interested. And a lot of that return comes on LCFS and RINs and the way you stack those up. There's also carbon trading credits as well that are involved as well. So it's fairly complicated. We could do a whole seminar just on that alone. Great. Any, anything else on this, this question of the return on investment for projects and, and what does it take to make these projects viable? Uh, yeah, basically, I mean, from our perspective is the way the viability works for ours is, you know, you got to have, we start with, there's three things you have to have. One, you got to have a feedstock supply that you can lock in at a fixed or, or a, a kind of a, a, give me a variable price, but you can lock it to diesel or whatever, but you have a fixed price for about 10 to 20 years. You got to lock in the offtakes at a like a floor price for about 10 years as well. And then you have to have a process guarantee wrapped around your process. Once you have those three things in place, then you got to look for the state that you're going to and any incentives that they may have. And a lot of it comes down to permitting, right? Permitting can take a long time in each of these states and how they go about permitting and how they how they basically do it. The thing about permitting is, is that from our perspective is, you know, just tell me what I have to meet, we'll meet them. The problem is that you get the public comment period after every time, you know, every 60 days, California would example that, that CEQA process carry out, you know, for a year, two years, whereas other states you can do it in a year, in a year matter. All right, great. Um, there was a question that came in about uh, processing of woody inputs and uh, uh, particulate matter and other emissions. You know, Nels had some great points about the importance of uh, addressing criteria air pollutants and the, all the big problems that we have from uh, uh, air quality, you know, particularly hitting, hitting uh, heavily burdened communities disproportionately. What are the air emissions from these projects and what are the, what are the benefits from the, the use of of uh, renewable fuels for air quality. Anyone want to take that? Uh, this is Tad. I'm happy to jump into at least the comparison of air emissions from pile burn compared to emissions expected from the Lakeview facility. There is a very significant delta there, um, we, we know from research conducted by a variety of entities, some of those in California, such as air districts that are, that reside in, that have air sheds that are adjacent to forest landscapes. There is very significant emissions from pile burn activities, as well as wildfire. Both of those will be mitigated with the reduction in fuels load and reduction in open pile burning in the Lakeview area. So net net will be airshed improvement. And from a plant and from a plant perspective is we are a minor source for emissions. We basically capture all of ours as so there's really we're a minor source. Um, so uh, and actually a group out of uh, Twin Cities does all our permitting emergent does all our permitting for us anyway, but we are a minor source. All right, great. 
Um, what what about um, this? Could be for any of our any of our speakers. Maybe maybe directed a little at Eric, um, but. You know, there's this question about, you know, in the upper Midwest, there are a number of existing mills. There's uh, pulp and paper and, and uh, engineered wood product, lumber. Uh, there is some infrastructure in place. What are the opportunities to find some synergy uh, to build projects into existing mills? Um, that's... <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question. It's... it's uh complicated to answer um you know typically if a, a closed craft mill uh you know i think the there are some assets available um like like the wood yard and the, and the chipping facilities but most of the most of the technology is would have would be replaced now there's been there have been a number of projects over the years both in this country and, and around the world looking at uh, developing fuels as a co-product strategy, whether it's gasification of black liquor uh, or uh, producing, uh, you know, syn gas from from residuals for as as part of the mill strategy, um, you know. So th th these have been explored uh, over the years. Uh, I, one one way to put it, I'll rely on. Uh, I'll, I'll, Terry and Tad a little bit, you know, one way to think about this is th these things are technologically possible. And, uh, and you saw from Terry and Tad's presentation that, you know, they, they clearly have invested in a technological platform, but uh, the technology is a necessary, but not by itself a sufficient um, uh, criteria for a successful project. You need, you need all of the other components that, that they have worked really hard to pull together to make that a su successful project. So, you know, from the, um, you know, from the standpoint of, yes, is, are these technically possible? Um, there, there are some things that have been shown to, to work, um, but it takes, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of pulling a lot of the, all those threads together to make a successful uh, commercialization project. Well, this is Jim Boyer. Let me weigh on it as well. You know, if we produce renewable fuels here in Minnesota, uh, all of our industries are really under the gun to reduce their carbon footprint. And to the extent that renewable fuels can help not only wood-based industries, but any industry uh, reduce their footprint, it would be, it would be of course, helpful. Uh, and as we all know, when you do a life cycle assessment, you look at all the inputs related to transportation of, of raw materials and transportation of goods and other kind of operations within a plant. So there's certainly opportunities for synergy uh, with industry as we develop uh, renewable low impact fuels. All right, great, great answers there. Um... You know, moving over to the, the sustainability issue, and this could be uh, Dr. Boyer, Rick, Nels, you know, we know we'll get questions, you know, about sustainability, sustainability of supply. And, um, you know, we talked about carbon, carbon debt and, and uh, the carbon balance of the projects. What, what should we be doing in a proactive way to, you know, show the public that, that uh, these projects can be done sustainably or to make sure that the, the, you know, the guardrails are in place to, to assure sustainability for these projects? Well, let me, let me take a, a real quick crack at that. Um, I think there's much we can, we can do to help the public understand, uh, but one of the things we need to do is get around uh, the idea that, that renewable fuels can only come from a plantation. Uh, and to make the case that, that we've got a large forest landscape out there in which growth far exceeds harvest and in which uh, biomass on the landscape uh, exceeds significantly what's been there historically. Uh, and that we're addressing future problems by getting some of that bi biomass off the land. Um, so I, I guess that's one, of, one approach I'd suggest. Yeah, <clears throat> this is Rick. Um, 
You know, the public has a lot of perceptions about forest management and often looks at a timber harvest site and, um, you know, it, it's unsightly and they don't like it. Uh, one of the things that makes it unsightly is the amount of slash left over on the site. And so removing that slash can, can help clean up the appearances. But the assurances that we have to make are that what we're doing is sustainable over the long haul. It is not harmful to soil, the water, the air. Um, and in fact, by removing some of this material, we'll be helping because uh, we'll be removing that material before it decays and releases carbon. Uh, it'll regenerate back to a forest more quickly and without additional inputs. What we see as is, is an opportunity is the fact that we can start telling this age old great story about what our forests can do for us in a new way in pointing out that forest management uh, is part of how we can address climate change. Uh, by sequestering carbon and that a young, rapidly growing forest sequesters carbon at a faster rate than an older forest, especially one that's on the downhill decline. So I think there's opportunities there to help educate people. And then again, the, the Forest Resources Council's voluntary site level guidelines for biomass harvesting looked at all of the science about what needs to be left behind in different systems. and. Uh, just helping to put that out there so that the public can see that it's based in science uh, will help. All right. A anything from you, Nels? Well, I, <clears throat> I think uh, Rick, Rick said it well. And uh, I would say um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is just uh, an open and and transparent communication with the, some, an agency, a, a regulatory agency, like the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. You know, before this, uh, uh, this webinar, I, I checked in with a couple of uh, DNR employees to, to see what they thought. And uh, I, I definitely think the, they, they could provide some, um, some trusted third-party verification to, to ensure that um, the, uh, this innovative process is, is sustainable. So thanks, Brennan. Thanks a lot. Well, um, you know, we're, we're about out of time. Uh, we're, we're right at, at uh, two o'clock on my clock. So uh, I want to just offer a huge thank you to all of our speakers and panelists, a big virtual round of applause. And I'll, I'll just, you know, mention to, to those of you listening, um, you know, there is a lot of momentum around this idea of uh, clean fuels policy. Um, a clean fuels standard just passed the Washington legislature. Uh, there were clean fuel policy bills um, in New Mexico and New York this year. And, and uh, I'm based in Minnesota. Um, there's a lot of interest in this in a number of Midwestern states. But you know, this year in Minnesota, we did see a clean fuel policy uh, piece of legislation called the Future Fuels Act that was introduced on a bipartisan basis in the Senate and House. And that, that Future Fuels Act has uh, passed the Minnesota House and is uh, uh, part of the House uh, climate, or sorry, uh, energy and commerce bill. And so this is gonna be under discussion as part of the uh, conference committee um, process in the Minnesota legislature this year. And so, uh, you know, again, a lot of momentum behind this idea. I think we're seeing, you know, a potential upside, potential for these policies to attract more investment and make uh, projects like this possible in more places. So uh, this is just the beginning of the discussion, but uh, we had had a lot of good uh, good content today and, and appreciate everyone's time. Um, we, we, we would appreciate um, input on the case studies. Um, and so we'll uh, send that out to those who, who uh, registered for the event. You can uh, download the, the white paper about the clean fuel policy on our website at betterenergy.org slash clean fuels paper. Uh, follow Great Plains Institute on social media and sign up for our e-newsletter. And uh, with that, I will conclude. And uh, thank you again for your time. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>